Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a guest expert. We have Lynn Lyons, who is one of my favorite people in the world to talk to. And she and I are talking today about all things anxiety and parenting and how anxiety shows up in our parenting, how we can remedy that, and also ways in which we can help our children not become anxious. This is a really useful and wonderful conversation. And also, I just have to say I appreciate Lynn so much because she's so funny and fun to talk to. And this is her third time coming on the podcast. So if you want to check out the other other episodes that Lynn was my guest on, check out episode 35 and episode 45. Those both featured Lynn and also were excellent conversations. A couple of quick things before we dive in. I wanted to share a listener review and this is from Charlie and Charlie says, this has become one of my go-to podcasts while folding laundry or taking a walk to help me continue my mission of being a peaceful parent. I love the variety of formats, the guest interviews, coaching calls, etc., and Sarah's gentle guiding voice, which ends up being a voice in my head when confronted with a hard situation with my kids. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your wealth of knowledge so compassionately and accessibly. Ah, thank you so much, Charlie. I would love it if you left a review, and if you really wanted to support us in the podcast, it would be amazing if you would check out becoming a patron of the podcast. You can support us and help us keep this podcast ad-free and help to you know, help us with some of the, the costs associated with producing it and that's a lot of time and energy that goes into this podcast as well. So if you would like to consider supporting the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash peaceful parenting. That's patreon.com slash peaceful parenting to find out how you can support us. And also I would like to support you. And so I have a free course called how to stop yelling at your kids. If you find it hard to stay calm when things are challenging, if you yell, or even if you just get frustrated and annoyed and you want to know how to bring yourself back to that untriggered state, check out my free course, How to Stop Yelling at Your Kids. You can go to sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling. Again, that's sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling. And now let's dive into the episode and meet Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me back. I am delighted to be with you. You're our first ever three-time guest. Wow. You were tied with Ned Johnson for two times before, but now you're the the th- first three times. So I know our listeners really enjoy the episodes with you. So I'm so happy that you agreed to come back on. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I feel like I'm in good company with Zed, but I mean, Ned, my son's name is Zed. I said Zed. <laughs> Ned, Ned. I have a son named Zed. We're talking about Ned. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we feel yeah. like we're on a Dr. Seuss show or something. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Ned and Zed jump on the bed. Yeah. That's okay. Right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Introduce yourself. So I am Lynn Lyons. I am a clinical social worker by degree. I'm a psychotherapist. I've been in practice for, gosh, this is my 32nd year as a, as a clinician. I've been in private practice for most of those years, actually. I do a lot of speaking and training and working with schools on anxiety. I work a lot with families. I have a family, a very family-based approach. I write books. I've written a bunch of books. We'll talk about my new book, I'm sure. I was one of the featured experts in the documentary that just came out called Anxious Nation, which is is sort of making its way across the country in film festivals and limited release. Cool. So that's been kind of cool. Yeah. 
So, so and you're the author. You're, one of your books that you co-authored is "Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents," which people hear me all the time talking about your book. Like, I feel like I should have like stock in your book. Like, oh, I, well, I just I recommend it so much. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sure the stock won't pay very well because most people think you make a lot of money on books, but you don't. All right, good um, karma then. So, yeah, good karma. But you know, so so every time, like maybe every time you recommend the book, you would earn like a penny. That would okay. probably be, yeah. So don't don't quit your day job. Don't buy a Tesla. But Maybe yeah. an angel, an angel in heaven, can say my name every time I mention the book. How about that? That's, that's even better than a penny and okay. a Tesla. Yeah. Okay. All right. So tell us about your new book, The Anxiety Audit. Yes. Yeah, so I this is the first book that I've written that's really been geared toward adults. People are asking me, I'm getting questions of whether or not this is a good book for teenagers too. The answer is yes. The goal of the book, the reason I wrote this book was I wanted to dispel a lot of the myths about anxiety and about how it shows up and what we need to do about it because in my humble opinion, it's gotten really pathologized of late and I really wanted to normalize it. And I really wanted to say to people, to parents, to young adults, look, it's okay if you have these feelings. It's okay if you deal with this. These are the things you need to know about it as just a regular human being. So that's that was the goal of the book. I, as I was reading the book, it sort of struck me that it it's written for people who don't even realize they're anxious. Correct. Okay, good, good. I thought maybe I like was like, you know, off base. Yeah, there, no. Nope. And that's one of the ways, you know, when I talk about it, and if you look at the the sort of the PR stuff that the publisher puts out, it, it sort of is, we all have this idea of anxiety that, oh, my heart is racing or my palms are sweaty or I feel like I'm going to throw up. There's a whole lot of other ways that this thing shows up. There's a whole uh, a lot of ways that we try and manage it and cope with it that a lot of people aren't aware of. So you're exactly right. Like, oh gosh, I didn't know. And it's funny because I get emails from people or people post things on Facebook or whatever that say like, oh my gosh, I am a ruminator or I didn't know I was a catastrophizer. And so it's kind of fun. It's sort of like we're pulling back the curtain on these things that I take I take for granted, but that I don't other I don't think other people really know yeah, about. There's um so you know Deb Dana, polyvagal theory, Deb Dana. Yes. Yes. There's this quote yes. from her that actually I have it right here. The, the presenting problem your client brings to you is the outcome of a dysregulated nervous system. Look through the lens of the nervous system. And why I just thought of that was because a lot of struggles that parents that I work with come up, come to me with, don't realize that it's their anxiety that's causing the problem. Like they think it's, they think it's the problem itself, but it's really the, their nervous system's reaction to the situation that's the actual problem. Yep. And the way, the way that I would say my version of that great Deb Dana quote is that the problem is the pattern, right? The problem is the pattern. And so I talk so much about staying out of the content and thinking that that's the problem, right? So the the problem is the teacher at school, or the problem is dogs, or the problem is this, or the problem is social media, which you know is challenging. But but I really want people to be able to step back and say, the problem is the pattern that we have, that we don't know that we have, that's passed down in families, that's modeled unknowingly with the best of intentions. How do we step back and look at these patterns? And they're very common patterns. We all, I, I don't know that anybody could read the anxiety audit and think, oh no, I don't have any of these things. Yeah. You know, I mean, unless you're a narcissist, which that's another pattern, but I'm not going to write a book about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, some of the, the patterns that like, so the first three sort of big ideas of the seven patterns that you talk about, the worrying and ruminating, the repetitive negative thinking, the catastrophic thinking, and the going global thinking. The way I don't want to like lump them all together because I know they're different, but I see those things come up so much in what I was just talking about in terms of like patterns with parents and children and like from little kids to older kids, like there are all these things that parents talk about. The problem is, is that my three-year-old is hitting. Well, the hitting might be the problem, but the, the 
the real problem is the parents' anxiety and fear about the hitting and like, what does this mean? And are they going to grow up to be like a domestic abuser because they're hitting their mom? And like, then they can't show up properly for their kid and they join their kid in the fear. And then they can't co-regulate with the kid because they're so unconsciously worried about what this hitting means. So that that's like one way I see it with little kids. And then like with bigger kids, I see these like power struggles over hygiene, homework, and like you know, that the underlying anxiety for the parent, which they don't even really realize is driving this is like, will they be successful? Like, what if they end up, as Ned says, living in a van under a bridge somewhere down by the river, yeah. right? Like that, those, those like- That's the, those the Chris fears, Farley like, skit. That's what he's referring to, right? Yeah. Down, by the, down by the river. Yeah. Well, and it, it, you're exactly right, is that Anxiety, remember, anxiety, if we if we sort of look at it and, and, you know, worry and anxiety, it's really about promoting something to an emergency that's not actually an emergency. So when we see those overreactions, when we see that catastrophizing, when we see somebody jumping into the future and talking about what could happen, that's that's all the process of anxiety and worry. And how do we how do we take something that's manageable? How do we take something that's normal? How do we take something that's a developmental stage that kids go through and a parent's worry about it promotes it to this state of great tension? And then, of course, from that, as you see, and as you know well, turns into conflict, turns into power struggle. And and that there there we have the rigidity, right? There's the rigidity of anxieties that things have to go a certain way. So those those three things that you're talking about, the repetitive negative thinking, the globalizing, the catastrophizing, they hang out together for sure. All of these patterns sort of overlap. They're really not distinct from one another. You're exactly right. And we see it at different developmental stages. How about in the world where I often find myself is in the high achieving academic high school world, talk about catastrophizing talk about rigidity, talking about global perfectionism, right? If I don't get all A's, I'm a disaster. If I don't get into that one school that I want to get into, my life is over. That's all anxiety. All of these patterns show up in all developmental stages. Yeah. I'm going to mention Ned again and that quote from his book that parents and kids fear if it's not Yale, it's McDonald's. (laughs) That's all or nothing thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's all or nothing thinking. thinking. Yeah. Okay. So as I said before, I I think that a lot of people don't recognize that they're in anxious patterns when they're in anxious patterns. So if a parent's listening to this and that sounds familiar in terms of like the fear for your teenager's future or that your three-year-old's going to grow up to be like a, a psychopath or whatever... What are some clues that parents who might not realize they're in anxious patterns, like what what could you say would be some clues that they might recognize that? So one of the things that's sort of paradoxical is that parents are thinking too much. Anxiety is a disorder of thinking too much. And when we talk about rumination, when we talk about worrying, Susan Nolan Hoeksma, who I talk about in the book, her research was so instrumental in identifying this pattern, particularly in women, women do it more than men, of going over things over and over and over again and really feeling like and believing that that's problem solving. So if I just tell this story again, if I just repeat myself again, if I just think about this, if I just if I just keep researching, if I just keep looking things up, and you really get disconnected from your child. Because remember that anxiety is an internally focused state. So when we talk about connection, you know, I talk about a lot, I, I talk about this a lot on the podcast. I'm sure you talk about it on your podcast. Joy is not compatible with anxiety because joy is about, very often in parenting in particular, is about connection. So if you are thinking too much, if you are internally focused, if you are chewing this mental cud and thinking that that's problem solving rather than stepping back and sort of observing the ebb and flow of your child's development, that's a sign that your anxiety is is showing up. Catastrophizing, going to the worst case scenario. This is, I say this all the time. I want, when I'm, I'm training clinicians and talking to parents, we're going to get rid of the phrase, what's the worst that could happen? 
because anxiety is like, hold my beer. So we're not going to say that to kids. We're not going to say that to ourselves. That doesn't take you to a very positive place, right? Because the worst that could happen, who wants to think about the worst that could happen? The worst does happen. It feels terrible. And thinking about it and planning for it ahead of time, rehearsing it, doesn't make it any easier. So that's something that you want to pay attention to. Are you talking to your kids a lot about how dangerous the world is, what they need to be careful of? Are you full of what I call safety chatter? That the if, if we asked your kids, what's the thing that your mom or dad talked to you about the most? They would say, oh, safety and being careful and watching out for this and watching out for that. That is one of the things that absolutely contributes to kids developing anxiety is these fears expressed by parents repeatedly. Yeah. Just as a side note, how do we deal with like the last three years in terms of, this is a small small side. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wait, what what happened the last three years? Just in terms of that, how do you balance when there are actual, you know, things like COVID that we do have to be careful and safe about and not giving kids an anxiety disorder when you're talking about that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So- one of the things that when, when parents are catastrophic, so when they talk about the bad things that can happen and they go over that again, one of the skills that kids don't learn is the ability to assess reasonable risk. And during COVID, that was a really important skill to have because not everything that we did was risky. It was not, I live in New Hampshire, it was really not risky to go hike in the White Mountains It was not risky to go for walks outside where there weren't a lot of people anyway, but certain things were risky. And what what I see in the aftermath of all of this is there are people who adopted these very necessary safety behaviors that are continuing to do them even though the risk has shifted. And that's what we see in anxious families is that there's not a tolerance for any risk oftentimes, and there's not an ability to assess risk, that's a skill we want our kids to have so that they can say, well, I shouldn't go, I shouldn't go there because it's dark and I don't know my way around and so I should probably avoid that area versus, you know what, it really is okay for you to get on your bike and practice riding your bike even though you'll probably take a few spills. So what I see coming, what, what we can learn from COVID in terms of the anxiety stuff is how do we help kids be critical thinkers when it comes to risk rather than to be catastrophic thinkers about it for sure. Yeah. So. Or global, global thinkers. So what are some, when parents do, when, they, okay, say they, you know, listening to this, they're realizing that they are doing one of those three big negative patterns that we talked about, anxiety patterns. What are some, you know, assessing the actual risk is one tip I just got out of that. What are some other things that parents can do when, you know, say, looking at the the examples I gave, you know, your three-year-old who's hitting or your teenager who's maybe, you know, getting some C's in some classes, like, or maybe not doing their homework like you think they should. What are some things that parents can tell themselves or how can they help themselves step as- step out of that, those anxious patterns? Mm-hmm. So a huge thing to pay attention to is how often you repeat yourself. How often are you saying the same thing over and over again? One of the things I, I somebody just sent me a mug in the mail because I say it so often, talk 85% less. So if you are a talker, if you are going over things, if you are, and and watch your kids' responses to what you're doing, because the best way to get a kid to shut down, the best way to get a kid to sort of dismiss you, to tune you out, is to be repetitive, to say the same thing over and over again. So pay attention to that. You can give your kids an instruction, you can make an observation for your kids, and then be quiet and let them figure it out. The other thing you want to pay attention to is, are you aware, are you tuned into where your imagination takes you? So your kid's not showering, like you say, they're going to end up a vagrant. Your kid gets a C, now they're never going to get into a school. They're, they're not going to be able to get a job. You know, it happens when kids make mistakes. I had my, my younger son was, no, my older son, sorry, younger son. My older son was a really good little thief for a while. 
came home from a swimming pool with somebody else's watch in his pocket when he was three and a half years old. Where did that come from? I could have gone to that place of, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm raising a future criminal. Pay attention to where your thoughts go. Take some time to just slow down because anxiety wants you to speed up, to slow down. It's very helpful, and I found this when I was raising my own kids, to talk to people whose kids are older than you because they are very good at giving you perspective. And you know what? One of the really helpful things that I tell parents to do is to ask the people they really care about whether or not they think that they're a worrier, whether or not they think they think that the you're right a amount of worrying. <laughs> Sometimes it's not helpful to ask the relative who taught you this behavior. So if your mom is a real worrier, don't ask your mom because she'll be like, no, you are on the right track, dear. Yeah, that's perfect. You could even do it more. But to ask a good friend, to ask your partner, and, and really listen for that feedback. If your kids are old enough, ask your kids. I ask that in sessions all the time when I'm meeting a family. I'll say to the kids, which one of the parents here is the worrier? And, and they, they do not say, I say this all the time, but the kids do not say, oh gosh, that's a tough question, Lynn. They don't say that. They know, boy, they know. So it's really a matter of being open to being able to recognize these patterns. The thing that will shut down the recognition of you as a worrier is defensiveness. And it's, it, and I'm sure in anything, right? It, 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 and I get it. I get it. But if you can step back, if you can drop your defensiveness, if you can ask people, including your kids, and listen to what they tell you, you will learn an enormous amount about these patterns. And then you've really got to, it, it really takes courage. It really takes creating some new pathways in your brain to interrupt some of those habits that ruminating, the safety chatter, the making sure that everything goes as planned, the rigidity, pay attention to your rigidity. Those are things you can really begin to pay attention to. And then the final thing I'll say, because I know I'm going on a long rant here, is that small adjustments matter because sometimes it gets overwhelming. So if you, if you are a global thinker, if you're all or nothing and you're listening to this and you're like, oh my God, I do that, then your instinct is to be like, I have to change 100%, right? That's, I have global, to to, that's yeah, global again. That's, that's right. That's right. So you're dealing with your global thinking by going global. You're dealing with your catastrophic realization by going catastrophic. Oh my God, I've ruined my kids. You have to understand small adjustments matter. And when you do something that might seem insignificant or might seem trivial in your interactions with your kids, it actually makes a big difference. When you say to your kids out loud, oh my gosh, I am sorry. I have just been going on and on about how dangerous this ski trip is and I really need to focus on the fun. You say that out loud, your kids are like, hallelujah. Those small changes matter. Nice. And I love how you brought up courage because all the things that we're talking about, there's no way to know that they're not going to happen. And it's just part of life and the human condition that, you know, it's it's unusual, but bad things do happen and people do get COVID and die of COVID or whatever. And we still have to be courageous and go on in life and live with joy if we can in the face of all of that. Yeah. And practicing bad things happening, which is what worry is, worry is a rehearsal for the tragedy, doesn't make the tragedy any easier. Right, I've, I've I've never talked to a parent who's lost a child or talked to somebody who's been diagnosed with cancer, and they say, "Oh, you know what? I thought about this every day for ten years, and so on the day when I got diagnosed, oh my gosh, easy peasy." No, it still is really, really hard, and we just have to, you know, this is when we talk about anxiety. Remember, it wants certainty, it wants to know, it is on a quest to know everything, and one of the biggest shifts that we can make, and it really does feel like you're sort of handing things over in a way, you're really letting go of something, is to say, life is full of uncertainty. And I cannot predict what's going to happen next. This is why anxiety feels so compelling. This is why its tricks feel so necessary, that if only I plan ahead if I make sure I know exactly what happens, if I think about every possible thing that could go wrong and I plan for it, I am making my life predictable and it just doesn't work that way. Well, and that steals joy 
I was just thinking about, you know, the movie Groundhog Day and how mi- miserable Bill Murray was when he woke up every single day, knew exactly what was going to happen. And I, I bet the people who are those like rigid planners don't think about that very much. Like it, it takes away the joy of life when you, when you, when you know every single thing that's going to happen. And right. And you depend on knowing every single thing. You feel like that's what keeps your life on track is to be able to know and to plan. One of the things that I tell parents to do in in terms of cultivating joy is how can you be surprising with your kids? How can you offer happy surprises? That's delight, right? When we look at the delight on kids' faces, it's because there's been some sort of happy surprise. You know, you were going to have pork chops and broccoli for dinner. Don't tell anybody. Just put all the ice cream and the sprinkles on the dinner table. And when they come down, say, guess what? We're having Sundays. You know, I love that. I was my, – my parents just had their 60th wedding anniversary a week ago. And what my mom asked for, which I thought was so great, is that all of her family, her children, her grandchildren, and a few other close family members, write a letter to them talking about a happy memory so that they got a whole pile of cards in the in the mail. And when I was thinking about the memories that I wanted to include, certainly some of them had to do with just the loving consistency of my parents. I've got very loving parents, but a few of them were the surprises. And one of the happiest memories of my childhood is my mom went to the apple orchard to get some apples and she came back with two kittens. And we had we had no idea. She didn't even like cats. We had no idea she was going to do that. She just drives up and she says, like, look what I have. That is a memory of pure delight. Oh, Kathleen Murphy. <laughs> Kathleen Murphy. That's right. That's right. You read the book. The 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 unexpected delight of that, the joy of that, the spontaneity of that, the surprise of that. Anxiety does not live in that world. It doesn't. Worry doesn't live in that domain of of our human experience. Mm -hmm. I want to back up to just when we were talking about like when parents figure out that they're stuck in anxious patterns. One thing you talked about in the book, and I know you talk about a lot in your work, is that we can't stop the negative anxious thoughts from coming, but that we need to replace them with with other things. So, you know, the uh, kid who you're worried about their about their grades and you're thinking, oh, they'll never get into school. You can't stop that worry from happening, right? But what what you can do instead, what I mean you you say it. (laughs) What you do what you do instead. Yeah. So so I I stay away from the world the word replace actually because because that's that's too close to elimination strategies is what you're talking about, which you've described very well. Is that we have to allow these thoughts to pop up. The more, when you worry, the more you try and get rid of the worry, the stronger it gets, right? It's this paradoxical nature of it. So it's really about allowing. And then you can shift, you can unhook, you can say, I'm not going to go there. The, the, there's thought replacement is one of the things that, that I feel like it's outdated, but then every once in a while I hear that there's a therapist still doing it. But it's sort of like when I have this sad thought, I'm going to replace it with a happy thought, or I have this scary thought. Got, and I, I don't, I don't do that because then again, that says that gives the message you're not supposed to have that thought. So of course, the two words, right? The two words, of course, of course, you're going to have that thought if your kid brings home an F, or if your kid takes a baseball bat and smashes his brother's block structure, right? Of course you're going to have this thought of like, oh my God. Then you want to say, it is normal for me to have that thought. This is a normal thought for me to have. Now I'm going to acknowledge the thought. Hello, thought. Nice to see you. And I'm going to shift. I'm going to unhook. I'm going to allow myself to recognize that that is both a worried and normal thought. I don't have to get rid of it, but I also don't have to make my worry my life coach. So there it is saying what it says. Oh, hello. Nice to see you. And now I'm perhaps I'm going to take some action. I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to recognize, oh, this is the thought that I always have when I'm in this situation. When my kids start to misbehave, I always have these catastrophic thoughts that they're going to be living in a van down by the river. Whenever those thoughts pop up, the goal is to change your relationship with them. And that's we we talk about that with with feelings too, right? If you have a if you have a, a, an angry feeling, what are you going to do with that angry feeling? Well, we're not going to tell kids you shouldn't feel that way, 
but we're going to help them change their response to that angry feeling so that they don't hurt somebody's feelings or they don't say something they regret. So it's really about acknowledging it. We're going to expect it to show up. We're going to acknowledge the normalcy of those thoughts, and then we're going to shift. We're going to unhook. We're going to give ourselves a little grace here to say, like, of course we're having that thought, and then we're going to figure out what to do next. Ruminators will stay right in that thought. Worriers, and then they worry that they had that thought. That's the other thing that happens. You start with, why did I have that? My, my kid did this thing, and now I'm thinking that they're going to turn into a sociopath. Oh my gosh, why am I thinking that? What does that mean? And you start analyzing your own thoughts. It is a slippery slope. Worrying about worrying, yeah. There's, I mean, there's so much useful stuff in your book for parents, but one other, one other, I want to switch gears a little bit because there's sort of two other big, I, well, I could, I, we could talk about the whole book, but we want to save the book for the people to read the book. But, <laughs> but, but one other thing I wanted to talk about that I see so much happening that, that creating chaos and busyness that you talk about in the book and how that is really, I think that gets in the way so much of parents really being the parents that they want to be, but they don't realize it because what I see a lot is like, well, you know, I thought he had to have gymnastics and everyone needs to learn how to swim. I mean, maybe that's true, but you know, just like the, the packing of the, of the kids schedules. I know you talk a lot in the book about more of the busyness of adults themselves, but I see that just translating so much into families. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And, you know, when I'm talking about the busyness of the adults, remember that modeling is one of the most powerful things that we have. And so it is very likely that if you are living a life of busyness and packed schedules and and chaos, that that's what your kids begin to see as both necessary and normal. So it, busyness is an interesting thing. And I, and I write about this in the book and there's you know, one of the things when you write a book, you do all this research and you find all of these really interesting thinkers and researchers, and you find these studies that are just so amazing. One of the studies that was in the book that I learned about that I thought was fascinating is that people who talk about how many hours they work are generally overestimating by a significant amount. That was astounding. You said like 30 hours or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the more, the more that you bump up the number, the more you're off in your estimation, which I, I've known for a long. People will say to me, oh, I worked a hundred hour week. And I'm like, okay, let's do the math here. Because even if you work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, right? That's only that's only what, 84 hours, right? You didn't do that. But people, we brag about that. It's the same thing that people who have sleep difficulty do. They very much underestimate how much they slept. So they'll be like, oh, I only slept two hours. And then they go get a sleep study and they actually are sleeping six hours. So so paying attention to that um, in terms of you talking about how much you work. The other thing too is that being busy has become the socially acceptable humble brag, right? So, oh my gosh, I'm so crazy. Oh, you know, now to me, it's sort of a game when I run into somebody and they go, how are you doing? And they're like, oh, oh my gosh, so busy. Oh, so crazy. Oh my gosh, my life is so crazy. And I'm sitting there listening to this and I'm thinking, yeah, they're bragging right now. You can't brag about money. People like I'm so say, important. Yeah, yeah, I'm so, yeah, I'm so important. I just, time is such a precious commodity and I just don't have as, I just, you know, I, I, I spend my time. I'm so busy. So we want to be careful when we're talking around our kids and to our kids that we're not modeling that as a positive attribute. Right now in our culture, it is absolutely a positive attribute. You know, just go on Facebook and, and, you know, I, I, see this all the time. There are a few people <laughs> in particular that I, I that that I that I that that do this. And it's sort of like, oh my gosh, what a crazy weekend. Like I'm so proud of my kids, but woo, am I exhausted because we had three swim meets and a play and blah blah blah. And oh, I just can't keep up this pace with my amazing children. Ta you know, I'm so just talented like, and so <laughs> talented. Yeah. Oh, they're so yeah. Oh gosh, you know, whoever thought I would have such a busy life just trying to get my kids to all their events. You know, I'm like, blah. So if you can, if you can look at that and notice that and then make sure that you're not modeling that for your kids and you're not believing in your own sort of humble bragging. It's, it's very, it's very contagious. That's the thing that I say all the time. If we don't talk about anxiety and depression as social disorders, we are missing the boat. 
I was trained by an expert in depression, Michael Yapko, who I am so indebted to. He, the book is dedicated to all the grandchildren in the family, but also to him. And he wrote a book called Depression is Contagious. So if you haven't read that book and you're curious, it's, it's a great book. It is silly to think that social creatures don't have disorders that are socially driven, right? If we want to torture a human being, put them in solitary confinement. It literally will drive them mad. So it's so important as we're paying attention to these patterns that we put them in a social context. It's just, it's just so important. What are some ways that, that you see parents have been successful at that, that reducing the chaos and busyness? Well, I mean, just the very, the very blatant move you can make is to check and see how many activities your kids are scheduled in. And one of the things that parents say to me a lot is they go, you know what? It's not us. It's them. They love all these activities. I mean, they want to do karate and swimming and pottery making and get their pilot's license. Like we are not pushing them to do that. Your eight-year-old is not in charge of their schedule. And if you say to an eight-year-old, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? Most kids, particularly if they're sort of extroverted and they, they have a high energy level, they will absolutely say yes. It's not their job. You don't ask your kid, would you like to have ice cream for dinner every night or would you prefer brownies, right? It's a silly question to ask. Look at the amount of scheduled activities and balance that out with free time. Unscheduled time in 2022 is incredibly undervalued. One incredibly thing I, undervalued. One thing I saw, I've seen a lot when I, a big question parents often have for me is how can I reduce kids' screen time? And, you know, as you said, you're the parents. I just say, well, you know, you just tell them that they can't. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> you just take right. the device away. <laughs> right, right. But the problem that comes up next is a lot of kids don't know what to do. Right. Which is so sad. It like is they so literally, sad. They literally don't, it takes them, I mean, they, they eventually get there, but it, they literally don't know what to do and what to play and how to amuse themselves without screens or the activities. Correct. They are looking for something to entertain them. And a lot of activities are, are adult directed. So they don't know how to, you know, if we, if we said to a bunch of kids, hey, you guys can all go and figure out a baseball game. They'd be like, okay, well, how do we, how do we pick teams? Or how do we decide who goes up or how do we, because it's so adult directed. And when we say to kids, and this is, you know, you, you bring up an interesting point because parents get very anxious when they take away the screen time or they don't have all these scheduled activities. Parents get really worried that their kids are going to be bored. That that is, again, they go catastrophic. Oh my God, I'm not giving them enough stimulation. They're not learning how to do this or do that. I'm not developing their skills. Boredom is a place where creativity blooms, right? Being bored means that you've got to figure out something to do and that's creativity. Interestingly, I just read this research a, a while, not, not too long ago actually, where they were looking at what impacts executive functioning in a positive way. And two of the things they found were unstructured play and reading for pleasure. Right. And if you if you asked a bunch of adults, right, with, with kids, what do you think impacts executive functioning? Well, it's learning how to plan and we set up the Russian math tutor or this, right? We're teaching them these skills of executive functioning. Executive functioning develops in the absence of other people telling you what to do. And so so playfulness, and again, ad adults have to model this for kids. They have to show them what to do. But I don't know, you know, if you think back to your childhood, I, I tell people, I mean, I certainly did a lot of activities and, you know, I, I played tennis and I learned an instrument and all that kind of stuff. But we used to play this big game in our backyard called, I, I don't even know why we named it this, but it was called Dr. XXX. And it was the stupidest game that entertained us for hours. We would get an empty jar, fill it with water, and put some blue food coloring in it. And the game was that you had to go around the yard and you couldn't touch the grass. So you had to walk on 
the driveway or stones or climb trees. We had fences you could climb. If you stepped on the grass, which was inevitable at some point, then you had to drink some of the Dr. XX, like this would protect you. It was the it was the antidote to the poisonous grass. We loved that game. We made it up. Nobody told us what to do. And we spent hours running around in the backyard drinking water with blue food coloring in it. <laughs> I, I bet you, so much. I, I bet you there's some parent out there who's thinking like, blue food coloring, right? Oh my gosh, that must cause cancer, right? No, look, I'm here. I'm fine. We didn't drink that much of it. But that was, if, if, if you can, if we can give our parents and adults permission to have that kind of play and to make it valuable, it's truly, you don't need the science to back this up, but I'm giving you the science to back this up. Unstructured play is incredibly helpful to development of all sorts of social skills, cognitive skills, executive functioning, and also it just helps your mood, people. It just helps your mood. Well, and the lack of it is actually shown recently. Did you see that study about the Head Start preschools that came out last year? I think it was Head Start, but there was any preschools that they did like intensive academics to try and give kids who are underprivileged like the Head Start for that they thought would help them academically. What they found when they followed the kids like 10 years later or however many years later was that they're actually doing worse than kids who had gotten a play-based preschool approach. And what the study person thought was that it was the lack of play in those early years that actually hurt them. And what you're saying about executive function makes a lot of sense, right? So, you know, I tell parents us all the time, like early academics is not helpful in so many ways. And one, because it takes away the play and then that overstructuring takes away the play too. I was, I, I just, when you talked about your backyard, I went back to my backyard with my sister and all the games we made up. And I, and it also made me think about not only the time for unstructured play, but the unsupervised time that I know you talk about, which is not that the parent is sitting out there you know, oh, well, you could try this or, you know, oh, be careful or Yeah, or, or oh, don't talk to your sister that way or, right. It's it's conflict resolution. It's figuring out who is going to do what, right? It's all that. And that's all executive functioning. That's all, you know, if you're worried about whether or not your child has become a leader, well, let them all figure out how to play kickball. And yeah, it's just over and over and over again. Yeah. We had another game. We had another game we used to play called Oh Oh The Person Is Dead. That was the name of the game. <laughs> my um my mom's wife has had told us about these games she played with her brother. One of them was they would they would lie down on the ground and put like a piece of plywood over the other one and ride their dirt bike across <laughs> the person. Yeah, yeah. And then another game is a shout out to Nanny. They played this game called Bartender Joe, where they would mix mix up concoctions in the <laughs> kitchen and dare each other to drink them. And like None of those things would happen when the parents oh, watch, no. right? Right, right. I love that it was called Bartender Joe. I mean, this is the funny, like you think of the titles of these games that we're coming up with now, right? Dr. XXX, Bartender Joe, oh, oh, the person is dead, right? If you if you went to, there, there, is, no, there is no school or daycare in North America that is teaching those games to kids or that would title the games that way, right? But we we just had such a good time. And I'm sure, you know, it's, it's, it would be kind of funny to, to ask your listeners for everybody to just sort of comment on what were the silly games that they played. We had another game where we had this, we had a, a shed in the backyard and we had one of those slides, like just a, you know, a flimsy kid slide. And you would climb up the slide, jump onto the roof of the shed, run across the shed and then jump off the other side. That was the game. Round like and an round and round. And round. Yeah. An obstacle course. Yeah. yeah. But nobody, no, there was no parent out there saying like, oh, be careful if you fall off the shed, you'll break your arm. Nobody ever fell off the shed and broke their arm, but people fell off bikes and broke their, broke their arms. Yeah, sure. I mean, you could have fallen off the shed and broke your arm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Life is risky. Yeah. But that's, this is, this is, you know, sort of back to the, the goal of anxiety is to eliminate risk. So we go out and we take away all the things that involve risk. But you know what? Everybody knows that even in these structured activities, if your kid is playing on a football team, if your kid is playing on a lacrosse team, if your kid is playing field hockey, injuries happen. So this idea that the goal of a parent is to step in and make sure that everything is safe, that everything is predictable, that everything is scheduled, that everything is important for later learning, right? That we're building these kids' resumes starting from the time that they're seven years old 
all that stuff is backfiring. When people say to me, why do we have so much anxiety? Oh, well, we can't figure it out. We can't figure it out. I just say to people, it's not that complicated to figure out. Take a look. Take a look around. It's not that complicated. The school that I did my teacher training at years ago, there was a rule that when they were out in the yard at recess, they couldn't touch the leaves that fell on the ground. They couldn't touch sticks. And then when it snowed, they couldn't touch the snow. Oh, my gosh. The kids just kind of wandered around like there's nothing to do. Yeah. And so in contrast to that, my kids went to this Montessori school with Mary who like, okay, so here's an example of all the best planning. She was like the healthiest person I know, like ate healthy food, did yoga all the time, got this weird aggressive cancer and died very quickly and heartbreakingly at a very young age. But anyway, so Montessori Mary had two sons of her own. She was older than me. And the rule on the playground at the Montessori where they were is that if you were going to go up in the tree, you had to pay attention to how high you felt you could go. That was the rule. Yeah. I, I, I often recommend to parents instead of the safety chatter, they just ask their kid, like, do you feel comfortable? Like, are you, you know, you okay being that high and get the kid to just check in with themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing too, that we do with language is we, we, we say the things to kids that we don't want them to do. So we say, you know, don't fall or don't hit your brother. And their little neurology just sees them hitting their brother. It's hard to stop. You know, you're you're carrying the little bowl of milk, the, you know, the little cereal bowl, and you say, don't spill. So they 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 have a little movie of, oh, what does spilling look like? And suddenly their body is cooperating with it. If we if we tell kids what we want, if we say, pay attention to the milk, or if you're gonna climb that tree, use your strong use your strong hands when we offer language that that puts in their little brains what we want them to do versus what we don't want them to do you get better results mm-hmm. and it's not be careful it's not be careful god yeah i mean that that safety chatter it was just i i hear it a lot you know we hike a lot here in the in the white mountains and every once in a while i'm behind a family that is just doing the safety chatter and i cannot unhear it I cannot unhear it. Yeah. Be careful. Watch where you're going. Do you ever say anything? No, I don't. I mean, I feel like I'm off the clock. And so I try and keep my my nasty thoughts to myself. No, I I mean, but you know, I'll 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 look back at my husband and roll my eyes. When my kids were little, we had one particular hike where it was just out of control. And my son kept sort of turning around, you know, you, they can't see me, but turning around and sort of doing the like, I don't know, sign with his hand, like, like, what the heck is going on here? He just kept turning around and looking at me like, why is he saying this? So yeah, I don't say anything. I guess what would you say? <laughs> don't tell your kids to be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, hey, you, get, you you better rethink that safety chatter. If you want me, I can go through the research on how catastrophic parents lead to childhood anxiety if you like. Yeah, no, I just... I just have to sort of like take a breath and be like, okay, it's not your job. It's not your job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation as always. I love talking to you and talk to you for a lot longer. And there were, there's so much more in your book that I think will be helpful for parents. So we'll link to your book in the show notes, as well as anxious kids, anxious parents. And I really appreciate you coming on. I love coming on your show, Sarah. So just, just keep me ahead and Ned. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you're, you you yeah. are ahead. So, oh, all right. Well, let's let's keep it that way because you know it's this is a competition. Life is a competition. So we want to <laughs> we want to measure those things. I was thinking of the when you were giving examples of global thinking. We have this joke in our family. My kid saw this when he used to be in skate into skateboarding, and he watched a lot of documentaries about like the professional skateboarders. And one of them, the kid said, when he was growing up, their family motto was, "If you're not first, you're last." And that kind of just became a joke in our family. Like that's not that's not how we operate, but it was it is a funny joke. It's not, <laughs> Sarah. You don't say that. That's not your family motto. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good to hear. That's reassuring. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're not telling your son that. Yeah. I mean, we hear that. I hear things like that all the time. You know, what is, you know, one of the things you, you think, what is your family motto and what is the value that you're trying to promote? And you just got to, you got to really do a, sometimes you got to do a real self-analysis, a little critical thinking. What's the family motto? And oftentimes it's been passed down for generations. Yeah. I was asking when my, my kids came on my podcast last year and they're older, they're you know, almost grown up. And one of my sons, I said, what do you think parents need to know? Like what, what advice would you give parents? And he said, 
let your kids be weird. And and I realized that is actually a very a value in our family. Like like it really he had internalized that. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been so nice for you to hear. It was nice saying yeah. that, right? Gosh. Yeah, that's a that's a kid who is 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 thinking about tolerance and flexibility and being who he wants to be and all of that came from the messages he was getting in the house that he grew up in. Yeah. We're a weird bunch. Okay, before final question, if you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself? And I know you asked me this question before, and I told you when we got, first got on, I have no idea what I said before, so it could be to- something totally different. But my kids are at different stages right now. I think the advice I would give myself is you're on the right track because you are teaching your children how to be kind and connected. I would give myself a little a little reminder that I was on the right track. All the other stuff that we get caught up in is really not the result that I wanted. My sons are 22 and 24 now, and I think one of my largest sources of of parenting joy is that I have raised kind, considerate young men. Amazing. And so I think I would have I would have given myself just a little a little reassurance that 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 was okay because social social pressures can easily pull you off track. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lynn. You're so welcome. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.